This is the first of a two-part lecture by Professor Farah Ahmed in a series entitled Using Judicial Review to Promote Access to Justice for All. It was organized by the Caribona Network, the Faculty of Law, the UE Mona, Mona Law, and the Faculty of Law, the UE Rights Advocacy Project, URAP. In this presentation, Professor Ahmed uses insights from Indian public law to reflect on ways of protecting fundamental rights and freedoms under conditions of impoverishment, deep inequalities, and inadequately resourced governments and administrations. So in the first session that we had last week, I found it so interesting to see how participants were physically spread out over a number of locations in the Caribbean. So I wanted to begin, and I thought you might find it interesting to, to situate myself as well. As we've already heard, I'm, I'm from India, but I, I live and work in Melbourne. And as we're going to talk about access to justice and fundamental rights and social rights, I think it's also important for me to acknowledge that the lands on which I live and work, they have been the site of injustice, of violence, of loss. And the indigenous people, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin nations in Australia, they have been the custodians of these lands for thousands of years. And I want to acknowledge their unjust disposition and their loss and to pay my respects to their elders past and present in the traditional way. So, one of the really wonderful aspects, I think, of how the organizers have set up this session is that they have built it as a South-South exchange, a South-South dialogue. So I thought we should start by thinking about what the potential is for South-South dialogue between India and between the Anglophone Caribbean. As a scholar of Indian law, for me, there were many aspects of Caribbean jurisprudence and practice that I thought would really benefit Indian lawyers. Um, for instance, the insights gained from the Caribbean practice around damages for breach of public law rules, around <clears throat> the use of independent accountability mechanisms, and, account and around the approach to contempt of court. I think all of these experiences are really, really valuable for India, and I hope my colleagues uh, are and will continue be to be paying attention to the insights they can learn from your uh, jurisdictions. Equally, I was really happy to see that there's an openness, I think, to conversations with Indian law in the Anglophone Caribbean. And I've just noted on the slide one extract from a case where a court talks about the value of Indian precedents and, and says, you know, that this is of inestimable value potentially. So I was really, really happy to see that kind of openness. And I also noticed that some Indian public law doctrines and some Indian scholarship, and again, I was educated here uh, by Arif and Tracy, they seem to have had some influence in some Caribbean jurisprudence and scholarship. So I think we have actually really good conditions here for a genuine meeting of minds and a really true and genuine exchange. So I think that's a really wonderful part, uh, point to start from. But I do want to offer some cautions about this exciting exchange. And I think first and, and most importantly, I want to um, particularly, you know, emphasize that I that my purpose is absolutely not to offer any sort of um, prescription or to suggest or imply what would be best for any of your jurisdictions to do, because I absolutely do not presume to have the relevant expertise or knowledge about your local context or about your history or jurisprudence to say what kind of legal developments would suit your jurisdictions. So I, I do want to just be very clear about that. And another caution is, secondly, while I think there's so much that is shared about our jurisdictions, and I'll come to that, I think there's also a lot that is different 
And in particular, while we share the common law tradition, Indian public law has experienced a break with the past, a sense of there's no looking back. And I don't know how far that is exactly the same in your jurisdictions. And I think that would be something that would be useful to discuss more. And also, I suspect just from the discussions that I've had over the last couple of weeks, and again, you know, I'd be interested in, in different views, that our jurisdictions might have very different senses of the appropriate ju uh, judicial role. Because as we will discuss today and we'll discuss more next week, Indian judges have a very expansive role. And certainly they take on a role that is far beyond that of a traditional common law judge. So yes, we share a post-colonial context and we share so much, but we also have differences, including different social uh, contexts and different histories. So given those cautions that my aim is not to prescribe and that there are some differences between our jurisdictions, it helps, uh, you know, you might be wondering, well, what exactly is the point of this South-South exchange? Why do we, why would we want to do that? Well, for me, one key value of comparing our jurisdictions with others is that it prompts us to better understand our own jurisdiction. It helps us see what is peculiar, what is unique about our jurisdiction, as well as what is shared and what is universal within our jurisdiction. So I think that's hopefully something that will, that will emerge for you out of this discussion. But I think even more importantly, learning about what other jurisdictions do, it can help us imagine. It can help us be creative. It can help us think about the about what the law is, not just what the law is, but what the law could be. So I want to think about the aim of this discussion as being to open up the space for imagining the possibilities, imagining the potential for law, given the challenges and questions that our jurisdictions share. So what I've done today is I've sort of organized our discussion around what I take to be three shared challenges and three shared questions. That is, given what I take to be our shared challenges of impoverishment, of deep inequalities and inadequately resourced governments and administrations, how do we best protect fundamental rights and freedoms? How do we best ensure good and lawful government and administration? And how do we best promote social justice goals? So those are the three questions around which I, I want to shape our discussion, which I think and I hope are fundamental questions that we share. And in our discussion, though, I want to hone in on more detailed versions of these questions. That is, I want to talk about given these shared challenges that we have of impoverishment, of deep inequalities, of inadequately resourced governments and administration, how should we interpret constitutional protections to best protect rights and freedoms? And so that's the first more detailed question I want to think about. And then the second most more detailed question I want to think about is where both are options, should we use administrative law or constitutional law if we want to ensure good and lawful government or good and lawful administration? And the third and final more detailed question I want to think about is what role might constitutional directive principles play in achieving social justice? So these are the three main questions that I will discuss today. And my aim is to give you in a very broad and you know it has to be a somewhat rough way, Indian public laws answer to these three questions. And this is, as I said, with the aim of sparking reflection, sparking ideas, sparking insight about your own jurisdictions. So here are Indian public laws answers to these questions, again, in very broad terms. 
So on the question of how constitutional protections for rights and freedom should be interpreted, Indian courts take a very expansive interpretation of constitutional rights, and we'll talk about that more. On the question of whether it's better to use administrative law or constitutional law, Indian public law has witnessed what I think of as the eclipse of administrative law in favor of constitutional law. And on the third question of what role directive principles might play in achieving social justice, Indian public law has seen that these principles have had both an important political impact as well as an important legal impact. So starting with the first question of how constitutional protections for rights and freedoms should be protected, I want to take just one example of how a right under the Indian constitution has been interpreted. This is Article 21, the right to life and personal liberty. So I'll just read out what Article 21 says. Article 21 simply says, no person shall be deprived of his life or personal liberty except according to procedure established by law. So on the face of it, this is a very, you know, this is a fairly common uh, provision. You have provisions like this in many constitutions. And it's a, it's a pretty limited provision to some extent because it may be thought to be about situations where the state is proposing to deprive someone of life or of liberty. That is, for example, through capital punishment or through detention or through imprisonment. But in India, the right to life has been interpreted very widely to include or to imply a range of unenumerated rights based on the idea that the right to life doesn't mean a right to bare existence. It means a right to a dignified human life. So Article 21, the right to life includes, and you can see there's a range of, of rights that, I, that I've put up on the screen there. It includes the right to food. It includes the right to clothing. It includes the right to shelter. It includes the right to access to internet, to free legal aid services, to education, to health, to livelihood, um, to express yourself, to a clean environment, it even includes the right to sleep. And it's even, we even have some jurisprudence, I mean, this is less consistent, but we even have some jurisprudence suggesting that it's not really a right to life just of human beings, but in fact, the right of right to life of all species, so all animals. And this came up um, uh, with respect to a traditional practice involving uh, bullfighting, actually in my home state of Tamil Nadu. So really, the idea, you know, of the right to life is very, very expansive in India. And this idea of a right to life as a right to a dignified life, and this idea that the Constitution guarantees this right to life, this expansive idea of a right to a dignified life to all Indians, it's obviously a very attractive idea. But at the same time, I think many of you will guess that it also has had its share of critics. One major criticism is that this kind of expansive jurisdiction, it simply exceeds judicial authority. Because just going back to the text again of Article 21 that I've put on your screen again, there's nothing in the constitutional material, there's nothing in the text that suggests that these rights are implicit in Article 21. So that is a criticism that some people make. Another related criticism is that this kind of expansive jurisdiction is not just that it exceeds judicial authority, but also it leads to judicial overreach. And an often cited example of this is the case of Vishaka versus State of Rajasthan, 
And I'm going to talk much more about this case next week, so I'm not going to get into the details. But in this case, the Indian Supreme Court essentially took over the legislative task and it passed guidelines about how workplaces should deal with sexual harassment. And a part of the rationale for this decision was that the legislature hadn't taken action. It had been a long time and the legislature hadn't taken action. Um, so it was, the Supreme Court said, within the court's role to step in and pass these guidelines. So there was obviously a lot of support for the idea that we would have sexual harassment guidelines. But at the same time, for many people, the, the court's decision and the court's remedy constituted judicial overreach. But as I say, we'll talk more about this next week. A further and I think really important criticism of the Indian Supreme Court's expansive approach is that it is simply ineffective. So the Supreme Court is criticized and very often criticized for having very high sounding rhetoric without effectively guaranteeing rights. So this was a case um, in which the you know, the, the case of uh, Olga Telis that, that's on your screen. Um, this was a case in which the state wanted to demolish the dwellings of those who were living on the pavements. And so this judgment is known for recognizing the right to livelihood. So if you look at um, the extract that I've given you on the slide, you know, there's a lot of rhetoric. The court is saying the sweep of the right to life conferred by Article 21 is far and wide ranging. Uh, it does not mean merely that life cannot be extinguished or taken away, as for example, by the imposition and execution of the death sentence, except according to procedure established by law. That is but one aspect of the right to life. An equally important facet of of that right is the right to livelihood, because no person can live without the means of living that is the means of livelihood. The right to if the li right to livelihood is not treated as a part of the constitutional right to life, the easiest way of depriving a person of his right to life would be to deprive him of livelihood to the point of abrogation. Such deprivation would not only denude the life of its effective content and meaningfulness, but it would make life impossible to live. So in terms of the rhetoric, there's a lot of recognition of you know, the importance of livelihood to the point that it's elevated to the life, uh, to, 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 the, it, it's equated to necessary, being necessary for, uh, for life. And so this is what the rhetoric says. But if you actually read the case carefully and you look at what happens in the case, the rhetoric is one thing and the result and the remedy is quite another thing because the petitioners had asked the court to find so these were people remember who were living on the pavement and the state wanted to evict them so these people the petitioners they asked the court to find that the state needed to give them alternative housing before they were evicted from their dwellings but the court didn't do this and as a result, many pavement dwellers were actually evicted without receiving alternative housing. And these, um, these petitioners, many of these petitioners were people who were very vulnerable, very disadvantaged. So overall, the result, the remedy was somewhat disappointing. So in summary, the Indian Supreme Court's expansive approach to rights interpretation is criticized for exceeding judicial authority to interpret the Constitution, I said. It's criticized for encouraging judicial overreach. It's criticized for being ineffective because it's more rhetoric than result. And two related criticisms that I haven't mentioned so far are that while the Supreme Court engages in high rhetoric on the right to a clean environment and the right to sleep being a part of Article 21, it hasn't actually been very good at protecting the core textually guaranteed part of Article 21. 
So that is when you see that people are actually arrested or people are detained, in, including for innocent activities, for political activities, for activities that the government or the government supporters you know, don't particularly like, or when people face serious criminal sanctions, including the death penalty, um, and sometimes people are detained really with very little reason, very little accountability. In these cases where you would think, okay, this is the core of the right to life and personal liberty. This is the core of Article 21. The court has not actually done a very good job of protecting their right to life and liberty. So there's a kind of um, unfortunate situation where while the Supreme Court is happy to, as a matter of doctrine, acknowledge these broad swathes of unenumerated life, uh, unenumerated rights, when it comes to the core, it's just it's not um, necessarily uh, providing the kind of results you would want to see. And finally, uh, the, another point that I haven't mentioned so far, the court's expansive jurisprudence, I think many of you can anticipate and many of you will guess, it's led to a lot of doctrinal incoherence and a lot of the a lot of unpredictability in the law. So that as a lawyer or as a litigant, you don't actually know how the court is going to decide in a particular case. So none of this is to say that, and I definitely don't want to suggest that I think that the court should adopt a very straight jacketed or a very narrow or a very literal approach to interpreting fundamental rights. I'm not sure I think that would have been or would be the best thing for India. But what I would like to see is, yes, a generous approach to interpretation, but I would like to see that generous approach accompanied by clarity, coherence, consistency, and predictability in rights interpretation. And I would like to see rhetoric accompanied by meaningful and effective results and meaningful and effective remedies. And I would like to see Indian judges explicitly clarifying the judicial role and the limits of the judicial role. And I would like to see Indian judges deferring to the executive and to the legislature where that is appropriate and where that is due, because I'm not sure that we see all of this in India, despite the, you know, the quite, I think, famous, the quite, um, lauded broader inter, uh, interpretive approach that they take to rights. So we're moving now to our second question, which is about whether it is better to use administrative law <clears throat> or constitutional law to best achieve good and lawful administration, assuming that you have a choice between the two. And of course, you don't always have a choice. I, I appreciate that. <clears throat> so Indian legal practice leans strongly towards constitutional law. And this is partly because of the very expansive interpretation of constitutional rights that we just talked about. And in India, in Indian public law practice, common law judicial review is almost completely overlooked as an option. So as I was you know, learning more about your jurisdictions, one of the things that I was really happy to see was the extent to which common law judicial review and administrative law still plays a huge role to, to what I, I, you know, as far as I can understand in many of your jurisdictions. So this is not really the case in India. In my view, this approach that is the eclipsing of, <clears throat> of, of administrative law by constitutional law, it's had some non-ideal consequences. One key problem, as far as I see it, is that because administrative law, because judicial review of administrative action is largely ignored in India, administrators are not really given guidance on what they did law wrong. 
Instead, courts will typically just say that administrative action is unlawful because it breaches a certain fundamental right. But they won't say, for instance, a lot of the time that the administration breached natural justice or it was biased or it didn't give reasons. So they will not appeal usually to uh, administrative law norms. They will not appeal to the kinds of grounds of judicial review of administrative action that we heard about um, in last week's session. So as a result, when we have administrative action, which is unfair, which is unreasonable, or which breaches legitimate expectations, or which goes beyond the scope of empowering statutes, that is, that goes against administrative law principles, courts really don't point this out in any way that will provide guidance to future administrators. Their whole focus is on the breach of fundamental rights. So that's, to me, a key problem, a really big problem with the eclipse of administrative law that, that I see in India. Another problem with the exclusive use of constitutional law is that since it's harder to change constitutional law, because in India this gets made by high courts, the high courts and the Supreme Court, there's less flexibility in changing public law once it is made by judges, because most of the public law is constitutional law and it is inherently less flexible. And a related problem with the exclusive use of constitutional law is that it exacerbates India's massive problems with delays. And in conversation with some of you, I understand that that's uh, an issue in some of your jurisdictions also. Because at least in India, since constitutional rights can only be vindicated by the highest courts, it essentially creates a major logjam at these courts. Now, there are other problems that I haven't um, yet mentioned with the use of administrative uh, of constitutional law to the exclusion of administrative law, including it leads to a lack of what I'll call institutional comity, and it leads to problems for the separation of powers. But I won't say much more about this now because I might pick up on these next week because they come up really clearly when I discuss the innovative remedies that Indian courts use. Now, again, all of this is not to say, and I don't want to say when I, when I criticize the eclipsing of administrative law, I don't want to say that only administrative law should be used all the time, although, um, you know, as Tracy suggested, this is a particular interest of mine. But rather, I think, at least in India, and again, I can't you know, I can't make suggestions more broadly than that. But at least in India, I think constitutional law should be used if a necessary remedy is only available under constitutional law. And if that remedy is not available under administrative law. And I think constitutional law should be used if a case raises important questions of constitutional law where a precedent can be usefully set. So there are situations where I think it's appropriate to use just constitutional um, and, and, and not administrative law. And, and I think you know, a really good example and a really good uh, situation where it's really not just appropriate, but important that we use constitutional law is where a case has important expressive or symbolic aspects. So, for instance, a recent case called Naftej Singh Johar. This was a case where a uh, colonial times uh, unnatural sex offenses criminal provision was struck down for contravening, amongst other things, equality rights of LGBTQ people. Now, these offenses were struck down, and I think that's important for expressive and symbolic reasons. It's important that that case was decided on the basis of constitutional law, on the basis of breach of fundamental rights. If the court had been able to find a way of avoiding constitutional law in that case, I think uh, that would not have been satisfactory. I think it was absolutely right that constitutional law was used there. 
And equally, I think there are some situations where administrative law should be used exclusively. So when there's a situation where there's a reason to preserve flexibility in legal development, so we think, okay, this is where the, the law should go, but you want to preserve some kind of flexibility. That's one situation in which administrative law should be used exclusively or where constitutional law issues are not justiciable, or they, when they raise thorny issues relating to separation of powers. These are other situations where administrative law might be used exclusively. But a lot of the time, at least in India, I think it's appropriate to use both constitutional and administrative law. And when both administrative and constitutional law are used, I think we need to think, at least in India, a little bit more about how they might be used together. So for instance, even if constitutional law is being used, I think it's really important that courts emphasize administrative law norms in order to guide administrators on how to ensure that their conduct is lawful. So an administrator after that interaction with uh, a court case should come away thinking, okay, yeah, next time I need to make sure that I provide a hearing of this quality, or I need to make sure that the person making the decision, you know, doesn't have these biases, et cetera, et cetera, because right now that doesn't happen. And when they are both used together, I think constitutional law should color the way that administrative law is applied or administered. I think that courts should develop administrative law to be more sensitive to rights, to better protect fundamental rights. So how can a court do this? How can they color administrative law in a way that is right sensitive? How can they develop administrative law in a way that helps protect fundamental rights? Um, well, for example, courts could have a more generous approach to recognizing the existence of legitimate expectations when fundamental rights, including social and economic rights, are involved. So that's one way. Um, courts might apply a more demanding standard of review of administrative action when, when fundamental rights are engaged. For instance, courts might be readier to find that administrative action was unreasonable if it impinges on a fundamental right. And we see that development uh, happening already in England and Wales. And, and that's I think that's something um, that is a way to protect fundamental rights, to protect constitutional rights, even when you're using administrative law and not constitutional law. And courts might develop common law grounds, for example, like bias, to better protect equality and to protect against non-discrimination. And finally, where courts, where administrators are acting under the power of statutes which provide socioeconomic goods, for instance, statutes that are providing people with water or housing or food or welfare, at least in the Indian context, I think these statutes should be interpreted against the background of constitutional guarantees, including directive principles. So in summary, I would really like to see Indian courts take a more sophisticated approach to the question of whether and how to use both administrative and constitutional law. There are times when I think one should be used exclusively to the, you know, to the exclusion of others, and there are times when both can be used. But I think constitutional law should color administrative law when they're both used. And um, I might just move on to the final question for today, which is broadly, I want us to think about how the law can aid the achievement of social justice goals, because I think that as far as I understand it, many of our jurisdictions have in common the, the situation of uh, impoverishment of, of many people who are vulnerable, many people who are disadvantaged. So it's quite important, I think, especially given the participants who are here today who work, many of whom I understand work in public interest roles, it's important for us to think about how the law might aid the achievements of uh, these social justice goals. 
And specifically, I want to share the role that constitutional directive principles have played in achieving social justice goals in India. So I might, um, I might just introduce directive principles of state policy, at least as we have them in India, and I understand that Guyana has similar provisions. So these are typically cast in the form of duties addressed to the state. They typically take the form, the state shall do X or the state shall endeavor to do X. And some examples are on this slide. So for instance, um, the state might, might be asked to provide equal justice and free legal aid, might be asked to, might be directed to provide and to recognize the right to work, um, to provide maternity relief, to provide a living wage, to ensure that workers are participating in the management of industries, and so on. So you can see the kind of direction that the constitution is giving to states in what they should do, they shall shall do what they shall what they should endeavor to do a really important feature of directive principles of state policy <laughs> is that they are not judicially enforceable. So the constitution says, and this is important because I'll come back to it when I talk about how the courts deal with directive principles. The constitution is pretty clear. It says the provisions contained in this part shall not be enforceable by any court but the principles therein laid down are nevertheless fundamental in the governance of the country, and it shall be the duty of the state to apply these principles in making laws. So we can talk about the impact of directive principles in terms of its legal impact and in terms of its political impact. Now, we might not expect, given the, given the section of the constitution that I read out, we might not expect that directive principles will have much of a legal impact um, because directive principles, according to the constitution, are not legally enforceable. They're not enforceable in a court. So you might think it's really up to all the organs of the state to try to achieve directive principles, but there's no legal enforceability. But judges have actually used directive principles in India, despite the fact that we have this article that says that they're not enforceable, they've used directive principles in a way that means that they actually have an important legal impact. So if you take the example of the Supreme Court case of Oni Krishnan that I will talk a little bit about, in this case, the Supreme Court made it very clear that they will interpret enforceable fundamental rights in light of directive principles. So directive principles may not be directly enforceable, but they are indirectly enforceable in that they color, they influence the interpretation that is given to fundamental rights. So just to give you this example of Uni Krishnan with a little more detail, Uni Krishnan was a case involving education. And in that case, the court considered the relevance of a directive principle that directed the state to provide free and compulsory education for children. Article 45, this directive principle, it read, the state shall endeavor to provide within a period of 10 years from the commencement of this constitution for free and compulsory education for all children until they complete the age of 14 years. So the time period there is important and you'll see in a minute. But as I said, this is a this is a directive principle. So in theory, it is not supposed to be enforceable by courts. But let's look at what the Uni Krishnan case actually did. What did the Supreme Court do in the Uni Krishnan case? So they say it is noteworthy that among the several articles in part four, only article 45 speaks of a time limit. No other article does. Has it no significance? Is it a mere pious wish even after 44 years of the constitution? Can the state flout the said direction even after 44 years on the ground that the article merely calls upon it to endeavor to provide the same and on the further ground that the article is not enforceable by virtue of the declaration in article 37? Does not the 
passage of 44 years, more than four times the period stipulated in Article 45, convert the obligation created by the article into an enforceable right. Now, so there's a lot of rhetorical questions here. And then, you know, if you look at the judgment, the court quite dramatically concludes, we must say at least now, the state should honor the command of Article 45. It must be made a reality, at least now. We hold that as a child citizen has a fundamental right to free education up to the age of 14 years. So that's quite dramatic, but it is important to understand that the court hasn't just decided to enforce an unenforceable part of the Constitution, because rather what they're saying is they have taken an enforceable fundamental right, that is Article 21, the right to life, in which we have already explained is very, it's very expansive, and they're saying that Article 21, the right to life, includes the right to education in light of the directive principle on education. And this is a standard way in which the Indian courts will give effect to directive principles, even, even though they are not uh, enforceable and even though they're not enforcing them directly. Um, so, so directive principles have clearly a strong legal impact, but I want to actually end by emphasizing as well their political impact, because they have the potential, I think, to have an even stronger political impact than a legal impact. So after the Unikrishnan case, for instance, India amended its constitution to explicitly recognize the right to education through this new article that I've put up there, Article 21A. Now that amendment, it led to the passing of a radical piece of legislation called the Right to Education Act 2009. This act required all private schools to reserve 25% of seats to disadvantaged children. And I don't know how this compares with practices in your jurisdictions, but I say that this act is potentially radical because it provides a pathway to a high quality education to a significant number of children who otherwise would have no access to these very privileged schools. And I think it's actually even more radical than that, because in a very hierarchical structured society, it has the potential to create social mobility and break down social barriers through education. So in short, I think the directive principles and the way that courts have used them, they have had a significant legal as well as a significant political impact in India. And they have the potential for even greater impact than they've had so far. So I, that's all that I really wanted to say about the, the three questions that we've talked about so far. But what I wanted to do is um, just very quickly talk about uh, these, you know, we've, we've talked about these three questions, and I just wanted to indicate what I plan to talk about next week for, for those of you who might be interested in coming along. So while I talked about the three challenges, uh, three challenges that, that I think our jurisdictions face this week, next week, I want to discuss two other challenges. The first is how we ensure that the most impoverished and the most disadvantaged litigants have access access to justice and how we ensure that the interests of the public are reflected in judicial review. So that's the first question, the shared challenge that I want to talk about. And the second is how we effectively guarantee legal rights and entitlements. And I'll be talking about how the Indian Supreme Court has tried to accommodate the needs of the impoverished through the open standing rules, through loosening procedural requirements, such that you know people send them a card and they might, a postcard, and they might convert that to a writ petition if it's on behalf of very disadvantaged people, how it's relaxed evidentiary rules to help disadvantaged litigants, how it's used amicus curiae to represent the public interest. And I'll also talk about some of the Indian Supreme Court's innovations when it comes to remedies 
including what we call creeping mandamus, structural injunctions, quasi-legislative orders like we saw in the Vishaka case today. And I'll also mention that our right to information regime has been very important and very significant. But uh, I will end there because uh, I know that there's a lot of, lot of food for fantastic discussion. Thank you so much for your patience and for this opportunity to engage in the discussion with you. Thank you.